Hey, what's going on, man? What's up? How's it going? Look like you just got the shit kicked out of you, man. You look tired, man. <laughs> yeah, I'm always tired. What's a good word? I'm sorry? What's a good word? Oh, you know, long day. I'm sure it's been the same for you, man. Yes, sir. So, uh, how, how you been doing? Doing well. Just uh, training every day, you know, just trying to uh, stay ready. Now, are you are you still in Maine right now? Yep. Yep, still right in Maine. Okay. And you're still training at the uh, the Glory MMA, right? Uh, my gym is Nostos MMA. And then I, I cross-train at a few gyms, you know. I train at Lozon's MMA at a... Um, I train with... Uh, well, yeah, that's right. That's what it was. Yeah, sorry about that. No, no um, Yeah, so I guess uh, before I kind of get it, talk about your career here... Um, yeah, so I gotta ask you, how did uh, Joe feel about the edit that you did today? <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I think he liked it. You know, he shared one of them. He's a he's a funny guy. They always do a lot of funny like edits on their their Instagram page and stuff. Oh, okay. So, yeah, that's all right. And yeah. uh, how how's uh, how's everything going yeah. on in Maine? Like, how's like how's the coronavirus affecting everything? I mean, they're still being really strict. I think if if the chart I saw is actually correct, we're the only state that the numbers are getting better opposed to either staying the same or getting worse. So um, they're, you know, they're trying to do the right things. The gym I own is actually in New Hampshire, though. So um, okay, New Hampshire's doing just about as good as Maine, maybe a little bit worse. But yeah, the, the rules and stuff as far as what you can and can't do are pretty crazy. But, you know, we're getting by. Right on. Yeah, I the only thing that kind of concerns me, and just because I don't want to, like, I don't want to put a bad name on, on America by any means, because I'm Canadian, I want to sound biased here. But I mean, you know, the numbers don't lie. Uh, do you feel kind of concerned about with, you know, with winter, like the winter is just around the corner, right? I mean, we got fall and you have winter coming. Um, do you think with the second wave kind of coming, do you find, are you a little concerned about, um, with MMA and sports uh, shutting down and fighters not being able to fight? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think what the UFC did, they did it well. I think Titan FC is doing it well. I think uh, mm-hmm. I think uh, Bellator is going to know exactly the blueprint, what to do. Um, I think with big sports, it's way harder because they are desperate to have their fans. Um, and th- I know that they're trying to figure out how to do it um, as far as... Mm-hmm. You know, doing quarter capacity or, you know, however they're doing it, rent out or, uh, you know, book out sections for certain groups. Um, but the way the UFC is doing it and the way Bellator and Titan are doing it or going to do it is basically anybody that comes in that's going to be part of the event gets tested and then they have to stay in that same, um, you know, whatever the area is, whether it's like a hotel that they're doing it all at or, you know, a casino, um, so once you're there, you're kind of locked down and you get tested. And then if you're clear, then you're good to go. If you're not, then you get sent home. Um, but I think that that's the only way to really be as careful, careful as possible and as safe as possible. I think once you start opening the gates to people that aren't getting tested, um, then there's problems. You know, if you're going to have whole sports teams locked down, um, then I think that's acceptable. But I don't think many of them are going to be willing to even do that. With fighting, you know, you sacrifice a lot for your camp, of course, but then mm-hmm. when you go fight, you're going to have a, a week or two where, you know, you you have the, all that craziness and then you get to go home and rest and then, you know, prepare for another camp, you know, but uh, I think with a whole sports season, it's a lot more difficult to try and fathom. Oh, right on. Um, do you, uh, so obviously you had your last fight in Bellator. So are you, are you signed with Bellator or was it just one fight deal? Yeah, so it's just a one fight deal. I'm uh, okay. right now. I'm just basically uh, a free agent, waiting for the next call. You know, I'll take a short notice fight if I get a good opportunity. You know, or I, I keep asking Bellator to give me the legit contract. My last mm-hmm. fight got um, like 35 million views on the last one, um, and I got on Sports Center and um, a bunch of good platforms, ESPN. So I think I earned a, a good contract. Um, but I'm just waiting on it. And right now, what they told me is they're they're getting all the guys to to fight um, 
that are already contracted because they're so backed up. But, you know, they're looking to give me a contract as soon as possible. Yeah, like I've heard about Bellator, they're definitely trying to... uh, I think what they were doing, because they're basically like... They're like they're the second biggest, probably second biggest MMA uh, organization out there, if not right beside with UFC. Um, I don't know. I the the idea that I kind of got from it was uh, I think they wanted to watch and see what UFC and Titan and all these organizations organizations were doing, what their what their plan was, and how it was going to work out. And now that they're seeing like, okay, well these fighters like for the majority everything's been pretty good everything's been set in stone you know the the cards have you know the fighters been able to make weight for the most part and you know they're watching how everyone's getting tested uh step by step by step so um i hope to see the bellator come back for sure because uh um just i a lot of uh fighters i really enjoyed kind of gone on to uh to bellator unfortunately you being one of them Mm -hmm. um and uh, so I, I, I'm really hoping that Bellator does come back because I, I, I enjoy watching different organizations and watching what they do. Every organization is different and they all do everything differently. So I, uh, um, I, I'm looking forward to Bellator coming back for sure. Yeah, I mean, they have a card that's going to be on the 20. What's today? The 23rd or 23rd, 24th. Yeah, I don't even know what day it is these days. <laughs> A card either tomorrow or the next day. Um, they're off yeah. at Mohegan Sun. I have guys that I uh, that I'm friends with that are fighting. Pettis and um, Bandeas are um, headlining it, so it's going to be a sweet fight card. Yeah, yeah, Ser- Sergio Pettis, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good deal, and he switched over to Bellator. So, yeah, I'm. Yeah, that's all. That's one thing I've seen a lot with a lot of fighters is like just. Same transitioning to Bellator because that's where you're going to get paid a lot more. Um, and I think, you know, I, I, I try not to put a lot of fighters I have them on my podcast. I don't try to put them on the spot saying, like, what do you think about the about pay um, compared to like UFC or this organization towards Bellator? But um, did you find there's a lot of uh, um, a lot more of a pay raise in, in Bellator or how that how that all work out? So with me only having a one-off, I'm not really in a position yet to to figure that out. So the first fight I took, I sacrificed the you know my pay um, to to get an opportunity to try and prove my worth. Um, and now that I did that, you know I got all those views. I think that I deserve like a main card slot in like a legit contract. And that's where I'll see you know the UFC mm-hmm. starts you at a certain amount. Bellator is pretty comparable <laughs> with that. If you're fighting like on the main card if you're just prelims um and you don't have an actual contract it's not uh it's not going to be comparable the one good thing is like you know i fought close ish to home i live in maine this was in connecticut so a couple states over um but i made about eight grand on ticket sales so um that's more than what i made for the fight itself you know if i'm being completely honest so it uh it definitely wasn't good payday the first one but I think that, you know, it would be every time that somebody switches over to Bellator or like, you know, they get somebody that was in a big league and then they start making a good impression with something like Bellator. I think it looks really, really good for the company when they have comparable or better pay for that individual. Mm-hmm. You know, I think um, they can, uh, you know, those fighters should be public about, you know, how, how that's happening. And like someone like Sergio, the reason he went over is because, he can make more money there. You know, I'm sure Paige Van Zant is going to go over and make way more than 50 and 50. Um, yeah. And there's other guys, you know, Rory got way more money. And then yeah. he gets a fight for the million dollars. Um, and then uh, now he's going to PFL because I think Douglas Lima was just a little bit too much for him at this point. And now he gets to go and, and fight on another platform with a million dollar contract or a million mm-hmm. dollar, um, you know, grand prize possibility. So, uh, and there's guys like um, Lance Lance Palmer, I believe, in PFL. He's won the yeah. and two or three times now. Um, every time the, that last fight is a million dollar payday. Uh, whereas you look at the world champions aren't getting that in the UFC. They're getting like I think five hundred thousand. Maybe some of them are getting more, but that's like you get a championship fight, you get like five hundred k. But you got uh, 
you get Lance Palmer, who I don't know the exact pay scale, but this, the every fight you get more money. The very final fight, if you win it, you get a million dollars. The loser still makes a lot of money on that fight. Um, but, you know, you're probably looking at close to $2 million um, when the whole tournament is said and done for that one fighter. So it's, uh, it's crazy what some of the, the leagues are putting out opposed to what the UFC is putting out. Um, but, you know, everybody wants to be there, so they're able to pay less. Um, but, yeah. And that's kind of why you're seeing, at least in UFC right now, is a lot of guys are trying to uh, just go for the big money fights. Like, they'll, like, I, I, I've watched a couple guys get the title, and they're calling out, like, all these names, and it's like, I get what they're trying to do. You got to bring, you got to make your bread, you got to, you got to, you know, you can make the money. But, um, I think it's like you're seeing how hard people are, are trying to, to get those big fights because they need to get paid and they're not getting paid what they feel that they're worth. And it's unfortunate that an organization like the UFC um, had done that. And exactly like you said, like guys like Sergio Pettis are going to Bellator because they know they're going to make more money over there. And they know they're, they know that they're, you know, they're, they, they know they're worth. And that's, and that's, I think that's good to recognize as a fighter for sure. Yeah, for sure. I mean, when you've been at it long enough, if you can make a transition to another worldwide organization, um, get paid more, you know, I think that's what you should do. You know what I mean? Like, it's uh, it's nice, obviously, being on the UFC's platform. Um, but if you've had 30 plus fights, you know, and you don't know how many more you got left, if you can take a contract where you're already immediately making more and then you're you're you have a chance of having one fight that is a million dollar payday, like that's more than, you know, that's more than so many fights combined. I think one of the best um, examples of that would be, um, uh, what's his name? The, uh, the commentator for PFL. So he, uh, it's not, um, can't, yeah, I can't remember, but he's a, he's a guy that um, at all the way ins, he'd do something funny. You know, he'd like give oh like yeah, a, like a cake <laughs> oh, to he, his opponent. Yeah, bigger or, guy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. He was just a funny dude, and he got cut from the UFC. I need to look it up, but I'm guessing that he was making, you know, at the most like forty grand and forty grand. You know, forty and forty. Um, he got cut, and then he considered retirement. But then PFL offered him contract. He went into the heavyweight tournament. He won all of his fights, and then he won the the title so he ended up making probably close to two million dollars with all those fights going from probably making 40 and 40 um 40 grand 40 grand mm -hmm. and then he retired and now he's a commentator for pfl so one of the craziest financial turnarounds um, i know career that's, turnarounds. so that's, that's insane insurance right there yeah like um i and i know yeah i know who you're talking i just i want it sean o'connell i think that's his yeah. name yeah yep that's yeah it. I love, I've always guy, loved that great, dude. great fighter, and it's just he. Uh, there, there couldn't be a better story, you know what I mean, for a fighter that turned it around. There's awesome ones where guys get cut and they get brought back, um, but nobody's getting brought back, and then like, boom, I'm a millionaire. You know what I mean? That that was the craziest turnaround probably in the history of the sport, to be honest. You know. And I think like you were mentioning how he. <laughs> So he won that that two million dollar uh, like tournament thing, and now he's like a commentator. I think that's definitely uh, that's definitely like one of the best gigs you can ever get, um, because I mean you have that you have that insurance after you fight. When you retire, you have that. Okay, well, what am I gonna do now? I'm I'm done fighting. I can't fight anymore. Uh, I I can. What is my job gonna be after this? And you know, get guys getting those commentating jobs that you know that's right there. That's easy, you know. And 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 I think that um, as a commentator, you need somebody that that that's a that was a, a pre or was a previous fighter that knows what they're talking about because you get some guys that go in there and not that they're not good commentators, but if you get someone who's uh, who was a former fighter, it does kind of help out, like. Like it does give a little bit of their mindset on what's going on, and they know what they're talking about when something, when a certain situation is going on. So whether like people will, um, I know like a lot of times, uh, 
like I'll I'll have like I'll have the guys over and we're watching whatever cards, whether it's uh, whatever organization it is, and people are like bitch and whine. They're they're complaining about oh well they're just they're on the ground they're not doing anything. It's like yeah, but you got to watch what they're doing and you listen to some of the commentators and they talk like move from move of what they need to do and you watch it happen. It's like that's why you guys need to pay attention. It's not just guys laying on each other. They're you watch what they're doing, and uh, and I think that's what. Um, that definitely is what helps with the commentators is you need guys that know, know what they're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. You know, he's, he's a great commentator and he's, uh, he's intelligent, but he's also, uh, you know, he's also a funny guy, you know, he he keeps Mm -hmm. people's interest. So yeah, I think, uh, I think that's great. And I think that's one thing people don't talk about enough is the, you know, what, what fighters do when they're all done because you know for me i got a, a shot at the uh at the ufc after um i don't know i mean it's like close to 10 years of hard work and trying to trying to get to a big stage you know big, big platform to finally make a decent payday you know my first fight i got 10 to show um i lost a decision to Dracar close um and then mm-hmm. I paid for multiple flights to arizona for that fight so it goes from 10 to about probably a little under eight grand um, then you pay for, you know, all your food. Um, if you have a dietitian, all your trainers, um, all this stuff. And then you're down to like, you know, maybe six grand or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then, uh, and then you don't know when you're going to fight again next. And there's guys that train for, you know, 10 plus years, sacrifice everything. They don't get an education. They get right into MMA, you know, have the highs, the lows. They finally make it. Maybe they win a few, you know, maybe they get a 150 grand bonus. Um, you mm-hmm. know, and they get 10 and 10 plus the 50, you know, there's 70 grand. That's pretty awesome. Or maybe yeah. they get hurt next and they, that's their only fight for the year. So, all right, I need 70 grand for the year, but I need to give 10% or 20% to my management. I had to pay for the flights, um, all the food, all this stuff. Um, you know, and maybe they lose in the next two. Maybe the UFC is like, all right, well, we don't really have the space in the roster right now. You lost two in a row. We're going to cut you. Um, you know, they try a couple more fights, um, but they just can't pull it together and they never get back to the big show these people are now like in their thirties, no education, you know, and nothing to fall back on. All that money is totally gone right away. It's mm-hmm. not a boxing fight where you go in like, all right, well, I made a million dollars. Can I be smart with it? Cause off a million dollars, you can probably live a, you know, pretty, uh, comfortably pretty yeah. decent life. You know what I mean? If you, um, unless you but, want to pull a Mike Tyson. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's a, uh, it's a really hard, uh, hard life. You know what I mean? Mm Because most guys that that do pretty well in the UFC, when they're done, they still, it's like, it's tough. If you don't own an academy, I have my own academy and I've had it for over six years now and it does really well. So um, that's what I plan to do for the rest of my life. And fighting has always been just something that I enjoyed and I love doing. So Mm -hmm. I've never felt like if I can't fight at like a big league, like am I, what am I going to do? Am I going to, you know, am I going to go work at a McDonald's or something like I always had this as like, this is what I have to thrive with. And the fighting is just something I'm going to do um, from here on out as long as I'm taken care of. Um, I get hurt a lot every time I fight, you know, broken orbital, broken nose, torn knee, broken ribs. Um, you know, uh, my nose was completely sideways in that Dana White looking for a fight show. And I tore my knee in that fight. Um, I had a high in my yeah. last fight in the UFC where I went completely blind in my right eye for the second and third round. Um, broken orbital and that Dracar close fight. So if I'm not getting paid at this point in my career, like I'm not going to go out there and lay it all on the line. Like literally right now I'm trying to build my name still because I want to get paid. Right. But I rushed home right. from being at the gym all night long, literally laying here with my daughter who fell asleep as I was trying to, you know, do this podcast. Um, so you sacrifice a lot for this, um, for my gym too, but also like I'm getting my own training so I could take a fight at any notice, but I'm not going to go in there and fight for two grand. So no, no. And that's, yeah. And that's the smart move to, to, to go here. Um, yeah, I don't want to, I don't really want to, uh, keep you up, uh, too late. So I'm just going to get right into, uh, with your, with your career here. Um, so can you tell me how you got into MMA? I know you said you, it's something that you enjoy, but how did, how did this all story start? Um, so yeah, I, um, when I was in high school, I played music, I played guitar in a band. And that was like always the, the only thing I cared about in life. And when mm-hmm. I finished, I went to college for a year and I hated it and I dropped out and I found a job at a passport center. 
Um, and I was just walking dead. I hated what I was doing. I was looking for something to be excited by again. Um, and every night I would come home and I'd watch WEC wreckage and Carlos Condit would be fighting and uh, Mike Brown. Um, and, uh, you know, Uriah was in there. Dominic Cruz was in there. So all these guys would, would go and just put it all on the line. And I, I looked at it. I was like, this reminds me of playing shows, preparing, you know, for the shows is like the fight camp. And then you go in front of an audience and you have to perform and you're subjected to their, you know, their, uh, their approval or disapproval. But you also right. have somebody standing directly in front of you looking to beat you up. So to me, it was a much more violent form of expression um, as than music was. But it was just it reminded me of that. So I uh, got into a gym, started training every day, started competing in jujitsu. And uh, I just started doing well. I became the number one amateur in the Northeast at 55. And then I went pro. Um, I fought four times in six months to get that Dana White looking for a fight show fight. So uh yeah just stay busy and just work you know all these fights have been tough because i haven't been able to be active i did tear my knee in my last fight but i've been trying to go for a little while now but uh mm -hmm. when i had that ufc win in calgary um with that liver kick knockout i didn't get a call and i was off for 13 months you know no payday 13 months ruptured testicle emergency surgery all this stuff um but that was already like eight months into no calls you know and then i get hurt and then after I'm hurt, um, I recover, and then I'm still just trying to get a fight. Telling Jim Rome to tweet the UFC, tell you know, because I had all these interviews on TMZ and um, on Jim Rome's show and Ariel's show, saying, "Give me, you know, get me another shot in the UFC. I want to fight." Um, finally, I get a call, and I had a 30-day notice fight card in uh, Calgary, Canada, actually. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's just you know, it's a crazy thing, but it all started from. You know me wanting to find a way to express myself again and i found that through martial arts so that's good man yeah. I, like, I like that story um yeah so just kind of looking at your resume you have quite a bit of uh submissions and knockouts so you you know obviously there's no introduction to you you're you're a black belt in brazilian jiu-jitsu um so do you enjoy the knockout or do you enjoy more of the submissions uh i think i think it's all good you know a finish is a finish mm -hmm. uh, the knockout is what way more people care about unless it's a uh a fancy um submission you know what i mean something like a twister or something weird like my last one got so many millions of views because it was unorthodox you know it was that it was pretty cool and, um yeah so but for the most part people don't care as much about submissions but the thing with the knockout is like Sometimes it's just you're in the right place at the right time. If yeah. you can out grapple somebody and catch them in a, a submission, then, you know, that's a, a beautiful thing. Um, but sometimes the same thing happens in, in a, the striking realm. You know, you got somebody that you're outclassing on the feet. And you're starting to, to find their number and then you just time that perfect, you know, look low, go high or, you know, whatever, you know, slip and rip. But, uh, yeah, I think... Crowd's approval is definitely more so based on knockouts opposed to submissions, but I I like both. You know I love I love submitting people. I love knocking people out. The thing about me is people think I'm mostly a jujitsu guy, and I mean I am a first degree black belt, but probably at least half of my submissions are from me knocking someone down with you know a solid right hand or a head kick or something, and then you know they're trying to get up and I'm choking them out or something. So mm -hmm. that's usually how it works. Um, so. Yeah. Now, do you, uh, because of that, do you, do you normally just want to take, do you want to just choke them out or is that just more, are you just trying to play it safe or are you not want to keep hitting them or how has that, uh, has that all work out or is it just in the heat of the moment? I mean, I, I very, very rarely try to take people down. Um, I, I usually just kind of stand and fight. If somebody tries to take me down, you know, I try and submit them. Um, <clears throat> I know I, I sometimes have a tendency to stay on my back too long when people aren't trying to engage me. Uh, my last fight, my opponent tried to engage me, and that's the reason I was able to catch him, because he was trying to submit me. You know, he was Frankie Edgar's roommate. He was a D1 wrestler, the captain of his team mm -hmm. uh, from, from New York. Um, and he's a brown belt under Henzo. So he was trying to engage with me, trying to submit me. So when you got two people kind of really going head to head, the submissions are easier. 
You know, it's just like two people standing in the pocket, exchanging punches. Somebody's going to get knocked out opposed to somebody throwing punches and the other person always backpedaling, you know, running away from the contact. That's what I get a lot of times. If somebody gets a takedown, they, you know, posture up and just try and play safe. They don't try and pass my guard. They don't try to, you know, ground and pound hard. They just <clears throat> waste time in my guard. So um, if you're playing keep away, sometimes it's, it's easier. Right. Oh, that's all right, man. Um, yeah, so I know you kind of touched upon uh, when you were in the looking for a fight um, in that in that one episode, and you were fighting. Um, how did that process go with Dana White? So was it um, because I didn't happen to catch that episode? So what uh, what like how did that process kind of go? Was it just immediate? You're gonna get a you're gonna get a contract, or how how did that all work out with Dana White? Um, so, I mean, it all started, I, I fought on World Series of Fighting, mm-hmm. uh, I fought for them, and then I was going to take a big break from fighting, because I'd fought three times in, like, five and a half months or something like that, um, mm-hmm. and then being, my back was just junk, I couldn't bend over and touch my toes, I was just, my last two fights, I was in a lot of pain going through fight camp, so I was trying to take rest, I was, like, two weeks of no training, just, like, eating bad, drinking, whatever, just trying to live life, enjoy summer. And then I got a call saying they wanted me to fight short notice, three weeks notice to fight on Dana White looking for a fight. And it was in Bangor in Maine because he has a summer home up there. So I had to take it, um, cut the weight, made the, you know, made the weight, took the fight. Um, you know, I got my nose broken real bad. I tore my knee. Um, my coach fixed my nose. My coach, Adam Rivera, he's like, well, adrenaline's still going. We're going to fix this. So he popped my nose back into place um before i even got out of the cage before they even announced me as the winner so if you look at the pictures with my hands raised my knee, my nose looks okay i still have blood all over me but it's not all twisted up but after that you know i was riding that adrenaline that high um and then i went back um and i was laying on the wall like in the warm-up room all by myself like i had team kind of coming in now whatever my daughter was only uh she was like probably four at the time um, four, maybe. Yeah, I don't even think she was five. I was 28. I'm 32 now. Um, but she didn't even want to see me. She was like afraid of me because I was so bloody. I was banged up. Um, my foot was busted because I heard it in my World Series of Fighting fight. Um, I threw it and hit, you know, an elbow or his head right away and uh-huh. barely walked. So limping around, busted nose, busted knee. Um, and it was just one of those weird moments in my career. It's like, is this what I'm going to do for a living? Like my daughter doesn't want to see me. Dana White hasn't said a thing, you know, I fought because they needed somebody to fill in because somebody pulled out. Um, but then sure enough, somebody came up and was like, hey, Dana White wants to see you. And like, all of a sudden I get this, this rush of energy again. It's like, oh my God, is this real? Um, and he came over, he talked to me. He's like, how old are you again? And I was like, 28. He's like, it's perfect time. He's like, um, you know, I'm interested. He's like, pick up the phone, you know, that means, you know, we're signing you. So nice Uh, that was that you know i got to shake his hand and make it official so yeah it was definitely a life changer but you know the crazy thing that fight i didn't even get paid for you know the ufc doesn't give you any money because you're not fighting for them the league put that card together short notice um they didn't pay the fighters they only allowed them to sell tickets and make commissions but they figured you're getting that opportunity so you you know people want to fight in front of them regardless um and i fought last minute so I was able to get a couple tickets, but it wasn't a huge place, and all the tickets were gone. So I was able to sell a few, but really I didn't make any money on that fight. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of kind of like the Contender series that they're doing now. It's like the, uh, it's kind of like I don't I don't know if they do get paid for that, but um, it's like the it's almost like it's like a, they want to see. It's kind of the same idea. They want to see who they can sign, who they don't want to sign. Um, you know, same thing. They want to give someone an opportunity. Um, yeah, I think that's kind of the same thing. A contender they pay though, because they, they, oh, you okay. know, Dana White goes to local shows and he watches talent that are fighting for different organizations. And that's mm-hmm. how, you know, he finds guys for a contender. They're bringing them in to fight in the UFC's, uh, one of their cages, the apex cage, I think. Yeah, uh, I think so. But you know, they get paid. It's not quite as much as starting money with the UFC. I can't remember exactly what it is. It might be 8-8 eight and eight instead of 10-10. and 10. But there's guys like this guy I know, Will Knight. Um, 
awesome guy. He got signed onto a developmental deal from Contender Series. So basically, he fought. They liked him, but he didn't have enough fights. So they're having him fight in different leagues. But he's getting paid by the UFC still. So he's getting 10 and 10. Then uh, if he wins 12 and 12, then 14, 14, whatever. So he's basically doing a, a UFC pay scale to fight in these local organizations where they're catering to him because they want to build him. They want him to win and then bring him to the UFC. They just didn't want to bring him over too early. Um, so that's a crazy situation, you know? The you're right. Guys that your manager finds for you that you think's like a really solid, easy matchup. UFC is like, you know, you're going to go fight killers. There's not going to be an easy fight. You know, there's only one time that they're going to bring a CM Punk or a, you know, a, a James Tony in. Maybe two, I guess, but... It's for the most part, it's you know, it's you know, kill or be killed. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I hope they never do that, anything like that again. That was, um, you know, I mean, respect to CM Punk. I mean, to go in, to go in and fight, I mean, to go in and at that age and to, to actually fight with guys in the UFC, I mean, like, you got to give the guy credit, but as an organization, I thought that was one, one probably one of the most ridiculous things I've ever seen. It was just, I get it. I know it worked with um, uh, Brock Lesnar, but he had a little bit of a wrestling background. So he kind of uh, developed with that. And I think he was fighting heavyweight. So, uh, you know, I think he had a little bit more of a opportunity there. Um, but yeah, the whole thing was, I don't know. Yeah, I think it was a little ridiculous. Punk <laughs> trained with, you know, Duke Rufus and stuff. But yeah, he, he did. Maybe a blue belt. Um, and he was not, he was not a fighter. You know, he didn't have any amateur or pro fights. He wasn't a wrestler. Brock Lesnar was a division one national champion wrestler, you know, and he's a heavyweight that cuts weight to make it. So he fights other heavyweights and he makes them look like little kids. So that kind of pedigree, he can mow people over. Um, and that's what he did for a handful of fights. So I think, uh, there's a huge difference. You know? And there's nothing you can ever take away from CM Punk. Most people would never go from a sport where they're getting paid way better to go have chore choreographed matches with mm -hmm. bigger fan base to go fight a real fight against killers. Like that's, yeah. you know, super, super uh, respect to, to him. But, um, you know, it's a big slap in the face of the kids that have been fighting, you know, in the local shows for 10 plus years, dying to get a shot um, yeah. in that weight class that have good records too, that never make it. Um, but then, you know, he gets that shot twice. Yeah, and that's all. It's just it's all about the views, fans. Um, yeah, it, it. Yeah, and I think that's what I think me and a lot of other people, probably yourself, probably get upset about is just seeing that these. Oh yeah, all these kids want to come in and and saying, "Hey, like, look at my record. Look at all the work I put in." But yet, you throw this guy on a on not just in the UFC, but you throw him on a main card, pay per view card. But yet, I got you. Got this kid who you you got to watch him and see where he could be going. Like where look at his career, and he could be he could be the next star, for all you know. And but you're getting that guy that's never fought in his life. He's got trained for a year or two, and you're gonna stick him in there. Like I, I don't know. I just for me that just didn't sit well with me. But you know, as you said, uh, it's you know it is what it is. Um, but um, uh, moving on here, uh, so uh, you fight at 155. Um, how do you feel uh, fighting at that weight? Have you ever had a problem cutting weight to the 155? It's always hard, that's for sure. <laughs> well, um, yeah, I'm sure it's not easy, but... <laughs> I'm in that, that weird spot where 65 would probably be a wonderful weight class for me. Yeah. Um, and there should oh. be more weight classes as far as doing this thing safely. But I'm too small for 170. Um, and I think I'd have to change a lot of things at this point in my life to, to fight at 170. Like, I literally weighed 170 after Monday night training. Um, oh, okay. That, you know, I was sucked out, and it was uh, I was way too light, you know. but And that's so crazy to think of that. I was that sucked out, but I was still 15 pounds away from what I have to hit. Um, but, you know, I'm not, I'm not dieting. I'm eating clean, and I'm uh, eating enough to sustain my training so that when I do – start a hard diet i can lose you know that last bit of weight quick and then you know suffer for those last couple weeks um but yeah it's not easy but i can do it you know and i'll, I'll do it again whenever i need to do you like 
this has always been kind of a discussion. They talk about, obviously, you got USADA and you have these uh, anti-doping, um, these anti-doping uh, uh, organizations that are trying to make all these athlete, athletes clean. Um, and they talk about the idea about, okay, now, you know, most, most of these guys can't be cheating anymore, as far as we know. Um, but they talk about the whole weight cutting issue. And they talk about how some guy they they have a theory that some guys are purposely ma- uh, not making like that last couple bit of pounds to gain advantage um, in a fight. Do you think that's a real thing? I think that guys that know they they're really gonna struggle to hit it, they'll they'll quit earlier because it's a percentage. It's not based on um, how many pounds you miss by. You know, mm-hmm. and that should be the case. I think thirty percent you give up if you miss by point one. You know what I mean? If you miss by, you know, over a pound, you know, make it thirty-five percent over two pounds, make it forty uh, percent. You know, and then just keep going up. You miss by five pounds, you're losing like sixty percent of your purse or something. Like who? I I couldn't care less. Um, you know, if if they put that in order, because I you know I take it very seriously. Um, and I think that if I ever missed, I would happily forfeit that much, you know, um, because I think it's just a slap in the face to your opponent. Um, you know, it's, there's 100% times where people miss weight, um, that have never missed weight before and just something goes really wrong, you know, and it's Mm -hmm. a scary sport and that's why I wish weight cutting wasn't a real thing. Um, what one FC does where they do hydration tests, um, that's, that's how it should be done. You know, you can diet down, you know, you know, basically starve yourself, have nothing in your system, but you can't be dehydrated and then you can gain weight. Um, but they're going to, you know, as long as they do the water test and you're good, um, then you can gain back as much as you want. And that's all from, you know, your, just your general nutrition, you know, eating good, putting carbs back in. Um, but you can, you can still gain 15 pounds just from food in your system. So, mm-hmm. Right. Um, yeah. And like I said, I don't want to, you know, I don't really want to, uh, don't want to keep you for too long. So I just got a couple more questions for you. Um, so, you know, you got a big win at, at uh, Bellator 232. I think that that's what it was. Um, so obviously, you know, you've been talking about hopefully, you know, they, they, they sign you to a, an actual contract. Um, so, uh, if you do happen to get signed, is there anyone in Bellator that you would like to fight? Yeah, I, I 100% want to fight that Muro guy. He fought, so my friend Nick Newell's in, in Bellator, and he had a, you know, just didn't have a great night with um, his last opponent. And it, his name's, uh, it might be Manny Muro. I don't, I'm not positive. Muro, though, M-U-R-O, I believe. Um, tough fighter. I think we put on an exciting fight. But he got the fight on the main card, which is what I want. I want to get paid better. I want to get on television. I want to get, um, I want to reap the, you know, the, rewards of all this that i put myself through so if he had that big win his last fight um you know against a friend that makes it even better for me to go out and try and beat that guy um but also with him getting that main card i think uh it it, since he won he should get another main card shot and me getting 35 plus million views my last one i think i i earned it as well both the same weight class you know line it up it's knock it down Okay. Yeah, sweet man. Well, I'm I'm hoping that you do get a uh, get the contract there, and hopefully I'll be able to see more on the TV. Because, um, yeah, because I know Bellator is a little bit more lenient with uh, they put on shows uh, on different nights. So hopefully we'll get to see more of you there. Because, yeah, with other organizations, it's just they throw them on on the worst times. Always on the nights I'm working, <laughs> unfortunately. So uh, that that sucks, but uh, hopefully we'll see more uh, soon. Um, and then I guess uh, the last thing I was going to ask you. So this might be more of an obvious question, but uh, how do you balance like training in in social life or family life? Oh, it's not not easy, <laughs> you know. Like yeah. uh, uh, my social life is inside my gym for the most part. You know, my okay. family is great. You know, we get to see each other pretty frequently. Um, mm-hmm. literally getting family time right now with my daughter. Um, right. But uh, it's tough. You know, we sacrifice so much for the sport. So when I finally close that that book and uh, I retire, I want to 
reap the uh, the rewards of all that hard work and run my gym and not have to train quite as hard, quite as often, um, and just teach and enjoy it. You know, and I want to enjoy that at an early age. You know, I want to I want to retire before I'm 40 for sure. Um, I, I think I'll probably retire before I'm even 35. To be honest, I'm only 32 now. I haven't had too many fights. I don't have too much damage. Um, you know, I train smart. Um, so until the wheels fall off, but you know, I, I, uh, I want to, you know, get to see my family more and, um, you know, actually go out, get some vacation for, you know, for, a, which is a, a rare thing for me to do. So, yeah. Right on, man. Well, you know, you said it all, man. Um, like I said, I, I don't want to keep you too long. I know you, got, you probably got some time with the family. So uh, I just want to thank you. Uh, Devin for coming on the podcast and letting me interview in here and uh, letting me uh, and tell me a little bit about your career here and uh, hopefully we'll see more of you soon. Yeah, absolutely, man. You take care. Thank you. Thanks, Devin.